Good morning, everyone. Uh, as we unite together in worship for our annual Harvest Thanksgiving service on this wet and rainy Sunday, we want to extend a warm welcome to you as we gather here in church. Uh, we also want to uh, extend a warm welcome to those who worship with us uh, from their own homes or over the internet or through our live stream. And we trust that wherever we are, that as we worship God, that he indeed would accept our thanks uh, for the harvest and our gratitude for his uh, salvation. There were some announcements running uh, on the uh, PowerPoint screens earlier about our ongoing ministry. Just to remind the young people, there's youth worship online from this evening at half past five, Sunday school through Google Classrooms, midweek Bible study on Wednesday night, followed by the Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, and if there are any questions or queries relating to those, uh, just get in contact with myself. Uh, this year, uh, as a congregation, we're not being asked to decorate or to provide items for decorations. And so instead, if you'd like to give a donation uh, of non-perishable foods for the local food bank, that would be greatly uh, appreciated. And those items can be left in the crates which are just inside uh, the door in the vestibule this morning. Uh, and just also on your behalf, a word of thanks and appreciation uh, to Marge Bell, to Beth Cheney and Myrtle Wilson for the floral decorations uh, in what's a hugely uh, scaled back harvest Thanksgiving weekend. But we come with our spirit and heart to worship Almighty God. As we come to do that, in my welcome I said it was wet and rainy. And that very much fits with our service teaching today. As we, in our call to worship, we turn to Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 22. And we see here two questions by Jeremiah. Firstly, do any of the worthless idols of the nations bring rain? Do the skies themselves send down showers? And then Jeremiah answers in that same verse, no, it is you, O Lord, our God. Therefore, our hope is in you, for you are the one who does all this. This harvest is our hope in the Lord of the harvest this morning. Is it to him that we turn? We're going to come now and turn to him in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, the creator of land, earth, trees, animals, and humans, we ask that in your grace and mercy you would draw near to us this Harvest Sunday. Lord, if the harvest we have come to embrace the principles of self-isolation and social distancing. And this morning, as we gather, we cry out to you, the Lord God, in our desire to embrace you, and to have your holy presence in our midst as we gather for this joyous occasion of thanking you for the harvest. Lord God, we desire your presence to be with us. We desire that your voice would speak to our lives. By faith we gaze up into the heavens and know that within its vastness that this is your creation planned and effected within eternity. By faith we reach out and we pull an ear of barley and we know that there within its symmetry lies the chemistry of life, the potential of creation within our hand. By faith we can follow down the path of the raindrop as we see it on its downward mission to water the earth and to sustain life. By faith, Heavenly Father, we listen for your voice. And we know the whisper that we hear from God has breathed a world, a universe into existence, and yet has time to draw near and to listen to our prayers and to accept our praise. By faith, Heavenly Father, we cling to your holy word. And we know and acknowledge the strength that we receive from it day by day as we meditate upon it. By faith, we strive to do your will, to be your light on the farm, 
in the factory, at the shop, or around the kitchen table. Almighty God, we confess before you how hard it is for us as your people to to be your people and to be the church, to be your witness in this lonely and confused world that so needs the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that in your mercy you would hear our prayers, that you would forgive us for the sins that we have committed. And we pray that you would remove from us the obstacles preventing us from being your light on the hill to a broken and needy world, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, in a small step forward in terms of worship, we, as we come to praise God, invite you to put on your mask and to stand, and we come to sing Uh, the familiar words of the Harvest Hymn, Come ye thankful, people come. Our Bible reading for our service today is actually a poem from Jeremiah. It's from Jeremiah 5, 21, verses 21 to 25, and will be read to us by David Hanna, who is one of our elders and is also employed in the milk processing industry. The reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 21 to 25. Hear this, you foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? 
I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say to themselves, Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. Your wrongdoings have kept these away. Your sins have deprived you of good. Amen. This morning, uh, with the boys and girls in our children's address, uh, we're going to think uh, about uh, the story uh, of, we're going to think about the story of the water under our harvest theme of the Lord of the harvest. Uh, And David, in the reading, uh, read a verse to us, and we've referred to it. Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season who reassures us of the regular or who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest and if we need an example of that almighty god has presented and given us that this morning as it has rained from the early hours the rains have come down so i thought well we we need to be thinking about this verse we need to be thinking about the rain and you've maybe had thoughts as you come in Uh, and so During the week, we've had a number of videos running on Facebook, etc., produced by Rebecca, thanks to the help of many in her congregation who took part. And part of that was the story of milk. So I thought, well, why not just uh, rehearse the story of milk? Because we might not all be familiar with it. Uh, So if you take here, uh, the story is going to come up, and we're just going to watch it. And watch out for the water. My name is Robin. Have you ever wondered where milk comes from? Well, I'm going to take you on a little short tour of the farm. The alarm clock can go off very early for farmers. Just like you like to have your favourite bowl of cereal when you wake up. Animals look forward to their breakfast too. The milk we enjoy comes from cows. They are usually brought into the parlour to be milked twice or sometimes three times a day. Quite often, Farmers give their animals breakfast first before they feed themselves. The animal doctor is called the vet, and they come out to the farm when animals aren't well and to help the farmer decide what attention they need to get better. This vet is checking to see if this cow has any babies inside her, in her belly. When she gives birth to a calf, she produces milk, and the grass she eats helps her to give more milk as well. How does the milk get from here to the shop, she might ask? Well, the lorry driver takes the milk from the farm to be processed and pasteurized into bottles. Then it is delivered to the shops where your mums and dads can buy it and bring it home. So next time you drink a glass of milk or have a bowl of Cocoa Pops, remember that God gave the rain to grow the grass and the grass to feed the cow, and the cow to produce the milk. Well, boys and girls, we've all learnt a wee bit more about milk, and uh, I went to the shop, and I brought you some milk today, Uh, and no doubt you've seen all that before, uh, and we'll come back to think more about it, but I thought, you know, Jeremiah is talking about rain, we need to think about the rain. And and you notice there the cows, they stopped on the way into the parlour and they stopped for a drink of water out of the trough. And we could think, well, where does that water come from? Because the cows are very thirsty and they need it. So here's here's a picture and maybe you've seen something similar at school. You see the, the clouds, the clouds in the sky and then the clouds produce rain or snow and that drops down on the land and then it goes into the land and makes his way into the rivers and the shocks and the drains, and makes his way to the sea, and then on nice sunny days, it evaporates up, and it goes round in a circle. And God provides us 
with the rain. So that's what Jeremiah has been talking about. And then I thought, well, we're humans. How important is water to us? It's important to the cows for producing milk, but how important is it to you and me? And I discovered whenever I looked up that our bodies, for for younger people, their bodies are 75% water. Isn't that tremendous? You're 75% water. And I don't have to go around mopping up after you. And then as you get a bit older, probably about my age, you're 60% water. Sometimes people think he's more air, but he's 60% water. And then as you get older, as you think about retirement and stopping playing football and all those activities, you're about 50% water. You start to harden up a bit. And so it's wonderful how much water is in our bodies. Uh, and I found another, another slide, another graph, and it tells us about how much water is in all the different parts of our body. And it's truly amazing to go and to study about that, or maybe you're learning about in school, just how much water is in each of our organs and each part of our body. One of the driest parts of our body are our bones that only consists of about 22% of water, right through to our lymph and our kidneys. And even our brain, where we know all them important things, even our brain is 75% water. So if you're having problems at school someday, just say your brain's waterlogged and the teacher will understand. And then you've got a graph, which is probably not that clear to you, but the farmers will start to understand that a wee bit more. It talks about how many litres of water are needed to produce a kilo of meat or a kilo of milk or an egg or a tray of eggs. And you see there, to produce meat, it takes loads and loads of water. And to produce milk, it takes a lot of water. It takes over a 1,000 litres of milk a thousand litres, a thousand kilos of water to produce the milk. So there's a fantastic demand for water. So do you think, boys and girls, put your hands up just, do you think we could survive without water? No. Do anybody think we could? No. So we can't, we can't do without water. And so we're reminded that the water comes from the heavens and comes from God. And it's important. So back to the milk. Back to the milk. You you like milk, don't you? Yes? Well, here's milk. And we talked about it on the the video. And it comes. And there it's all. It looks nice and white, doesn't it? And we can take it in our cereals, our Cocoa Pops, as Robin was saying. Or we can take a drink out of it. Mm, milk. But then, boys and girls, you know, I was reading a wee bit about milk, and do you know what I discovered? Uh, and the farmers, the dairy farmers are probably, if they were able, they were going to start to throw sticks at me now. But they say, you're foolish. I discovered that whenever I studied about milk, you know what, boys and girls? Have a guess. It's nearly all water. Did you know that? (laughs) It's nearly all water. And you can pour it out into a glass. And you can drink it. And it's lovely and refreshing. And do you know what, boys and girls? I come to the conclusion that there's an awful lot of people rising very early in the morning and they're going out to get the cows that have ate the grass and drunk the water and put them out to the milk and parlour to add white, to add the colour white to all those gallons of water. It's foolish, isn't it? It's crazy. We'll come back to thinking about that later. <laughs> so the question is this morning, boys and girls and older folks, who gives this important water? Who gives this important rain? And the answer comes that God, the Lord of the harvest, the God of the harvest, gives us the rain. And so we're back to Jeremiah, 
Let us fear the Lord our God who gives autumn and spring rain in season, who assures us of the regular weeks of the harvest. Not only does he give us the water and the rain, he then gives us the crops and he gives us the farmers to bring them in so that we can be fed and sustained through the winter. So as you see the cows on the way to school, as you watch the rain falling, as you drink your glass of milk or drink your glass of water, remember it is all possible because of God's goodness to us. Now this morning we're going to come to God with our prayers of intercession and they will be brought to us by Robin uh, and by Heather. Let's pray. Let us pray. Thank you God for all the people that help us to enjoy the food that we eat and the milk that we drink. Thank you Father God that you feed us as your children and look after us all. Be with us and help us to remember that all our blessings come from you. Amen. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today to give you our adoration for who you are and what you have done for us. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Shepherd and Saviour. We come to pray for those in our community and district who farm the land and take care of the animals. We thank you for the promise given to Noah many years ago and recorded in Genesis that seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And although there have been many times of hardship and frustration, you have been faithful to us even when we have not been faithful to you and your world. At this time of year we come to thank you for the harvest of the land and sea. Truly, you are a great and awesome God, who is always faithful and never fails. Today, we pray for all those who tend the land and care for the animals bestowed to them. We ask that they will be responsible in all their dealings and actions, and know God's hand upon their labours at all times. We praise you for our farming community and all those who belong to it. We ask that they will trust God to be their help and saviour at all times. For those who do not know you in a personal way, we would pray earnestly that as they go about their daily work and see how you, God, make the grass to grow to feed the cattle year on year, send the sun to ripen crops for a fruitful harvest must be a reality. We pray that they will confess their sin and yield their lives in total submission to your plan and purpose. All these prayers we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So that brings us to the part in our service where we reflect uh, upon the words of Scripture. That brings us to this opportunity to think about the Lord of the harvest. Uh, and these verses in Jeremiah's poem from Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 21 to 25. The lives and the businesses of many people in the past few months, they have been paused at home and abroad as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there's no getting away and there's no getting around that and we hope that we're, we're going to a better place, although that seems to be a rocky journey at the moment. But if you were to stop if you were to stop during the year, since, since lockdown, if you were to stop and chat to a farmer, they would say, don't be foolish. Life on the farm is just going on as usual. We're sowing fertilizer, we're putting out the slurry, we're feeding the animals, we're harvesting the crops. Farming never stops. We can't go and furlough the sows. We can't tell the crops to stop growing just because there's a pandemic. And farmers at times during the pandemic were, were held up as being key workers who were feeding the nation. And at the same time as they were feeding us, they were preparing for another harvest. Because farming just never stops. There is that natural cycle of seasonal events to be followed which reaches the climax in the harvest. 
this prophet Jeremiah that we're thinking about, who wrote these verses, he, he puts it like this in verse 24. Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. And in many ways, that's a reflection of the worldwide promise of Genesis 8 and 22. As long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, cold and winter, or so cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And even, even the thoroughbred townie or the city slicker can see the reality of these verses for themselves. This young man, Jeremiah, he was faithful, he was God-fearing, he was called to be a prophet with the responsibility of telling the crumbling agriculture nation of Judah or the southern province, the southern kingdom, that because of their attitude to sin, God, the Lord of the harvest, had turned against them. And so the prophet Jeremiah, he begged his fellow country people to listen to the message of God. In some ways, we can see Jeremiah as the pandemic prophet. He cried tears of sadness over his people, over his land, Judah. Not only because he knew what was about to happen, but because no matter how hard he tried, the people would not listen to him earning himself the nickname of the weeping prophet. And how must our health minister, Robin Swan, feel this morning? Is he not someone that feels like that right now, feels like weeping over the growing number of people in our land who have failed to heed the COVID-19 restrictions? Does he sit at home or sit in his office and say, Our people are foolish. They're not listening to the instructions. They're not obeying the directions. Jeremiah was weeping for the exact same reason that people were not listening and people were not obeying the instructions. Jeremiah was also socially isolated and he was rurally isolated with no human comforts. Jeremiah, as instructed by God, was not allowed to marry, and therefore he had no children. He had no family to turn to, and neither had he friends to turn to. They had already turned their back on him. The people were so hardened in their hearts that they no longer believed the word of God, nor, sadly, did they fear him. And yet Jeremiah was a key worker in the kingdom of Judah, preaching for 40 years to the people, but without any real success in changing the hearts and minds of his own stubborn and foolish people. It was like preaching to a brick wall. The people, they didn't agree with his message, and they didn't like his message, and they didn't, for that matter like Jeremiah that much as we go about our lives as we pick up the the glass of milk as we look at the beauty of the patchwork of the fields whether it be with the grass and the trees and the crops and the animals upon them in many ways we should be showing more respect to our farmers and for what they achieve year by year Because farming is a very challenging environment. Some farmers, they have placed their sense of security in their expertise in running the farm the right way. That they have placed their sense of security in the right breeds of livestock, in developing great genetics, in consistent grassland management, or using outstanding varieties of cereals and availing of the latest technology. But so, so often, there is little reference to God's GPS. There are those in our farming community 
And it is our Harvest Thanksgiving Day, so it's the farming community we primarily address. But there are, sadly, those in our farming community who say, we don't need, we don't need the Lord of the harvest to farm anymore. We're smart. We've figured it out. We can do it ourselves. And so it can be easy for farmers to be lulled into a false sense of security when the focus is not on Almighty God, when the focus is not on the Lord of the harvest. Actually, in the time of Jeremiah, uh, the farmers had strayed, and they had put their trust in someone described as the Queen of Heaven, and you can read about that in the book of Jeremiah. They had put their trust in the Queen of Heaven to provide for their crops and to grant them a harvest. And thereby they had broken the first commandment, which we're learning about in our midweek series. Jeremiah was given the task of delivering an unpopular, convicting message to the people of Judah. Now, if you read in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, God said that his truth sounded like foolishness to those who are lost. But to believers, it's the very words of life. And whenever I lift the glass of milk and I hold it up to dairy farmers and say, the cow's just added whitener to it, they say, Trevor, you're foolish. That's not sensible. There's more to it than that. You're being foolish. You have to understand what's going on. And so it was the same with God's word. It was appearing to be foolish. Those in Judah, they did not want to hear what Jeremiah had to say. They couldn't tolerate the truth. And this constant warning of judgment annoyed the people. Jeremiah, he uses this term, foolishness. And the farmers, they have their sense of foolishness. Because the farmers will say, and they have said to us as consumers, that it is foolishness that they get so little of our money when we go into the shop to buy the jar of milk or when we go into the shop to buy the the kilo of meat. They will say that based, based on the amount of time and based on the amount of money they've put into their farm and their hard work, it's foolishness that they aren't paid more for what they do. That's their argument. They can see the logic, they can see the sense, and anyone who doesn't is foolish. And sometimes, sometimes, as the consumer lifts the glass of water, sometimes the consumer may say, it's foolishness to go to all that cost and hard work to get a cow to produce white water with some minerals and vitamins. Jeremiah used the term foolishness in verse 21. Hear this, you foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Jeremiah, fair play to him, he's talking here like a farmer, isn't he? He is saying that God deserves more than he is getting. Jeremiah is saying that God has put so much into providing us with the rain and with the crops and the harvest that we, the people, should be giving him more back. Now, a farmer, a farmer surely can appreciate the soundness of that argument unless they're being foolish because that is the argument that the, foolish, that the farmer uses to us as the consumer. It's the argument they use, they understand, and to go against it would be foolishness. And yet, in the Bible, there are various examples of foolish people. The foolish man, the boys and girls and young people well know, built his house on the sand. We encountered a foolish man the other week in First Samuel called Nabal. Nabal is his name and folly was his game. Fool. 
The name fool suggests someone who is silly and lacking in judgment. Foolishness is to be without understanding. And Jeremiah said it about the people in this way. He said, they had eyes which saw not and ears that heard not. Now farmers may think that as consumers we are deaf and blind to their arguments about costs and the distribution of profit in the supply chain. But this man Nabal was also deaf and blind to the reality that David was coming down the mountainside to exterminate him and his family as a result of Nabal's actions. When we encounter foolishness, in our lives or in the lives of others, that foolishness is often accompanied by a lack of gratitude and a high degree of self-centeredness. Nabal, that foolish man, he refused to give food to David's men. And really the food was compensation to David's men for the many sleepless nights, the many nights of hard work of, protect, of protecting Nabal's sheep and goats on the mountains. Nabal was foolish, he was selfish, he was arrogant, and he lacked gratitude. And another cost of foolishness is a lack of rest. Jeremiah 6 and 16 says, When we do not have faith in the Lord of the harvest and walk in his way, we're both foolish and restless. And so, in terms of the commandment, the fourth commandment teaches us to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, and to rest. Now, on farms, there is work that needs to be done. There's essential work that has to be done on the Lord's day. And yet, it is so easy in this era of mass production and escalating farm size for many farms today to have become a a seven-day-a-week factory-style operation where rest is scarce, and yet the fourth commandment directs us to rest. Human beings, we were designed for work, yes, but we are also designed for rest, and the challenge is to find that balance, and we are meant to rest one day in seven. Scripture says that foolish people are without understanding, they're without reverence, they're without gratitude, they're without rest, uh, and they're without an acceptable sacrifice of worship. This harvest, this harvest, there are many in our farming and business communities who suffer from foolishness and from the lack of rest and a sense of contentment. And the way they are going, they will never have enough because their priorities are not right. Verse 22, Should you not fear me, declares the Lord, should you not tremble in my presence, something to ponder and to think about. We're meeting in worship and we have asked for the presence of Almighty God to be amongst us and he is here to meet us and how we're called to tremble in his presence. Jeremiah says, open your eyes and see that God has made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. And so God is explaining here his power and his greatness. He, he says, and look, even the boys and girls will know this for themselves as they've been to the seaside different times during the summer. God says that he tells the sea to stop at the shore. And what does the sea do? The sea stops at the shore. God is correct in calling the people foolish. God's laws are everlasting. He tells the sea to roar and it roars. He tells the sun to shine and it shines. How could anyone choose to ignore 
the Lord of the harvest and give their worship to something else? Surely this is foolishness to use the farmer's own argument. God deserves more. He has put the work and effort in. We should be giving more to God. And God says, look, take yourself down to the coast someday or, or speak to those who farm the sea on the fishermen's boats and you will see or you will hear that God has made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. And Jeremiah is explaining that in his creation, God made the sandy shore a natural barrier to defend the land. He says, the water, the water that we're thinking so much about today, the rain, whenever it falls to the ground and makes it way to the sea, it stops at that everlasting natural barrier of the sand. The water obeys God. It stops at the seashore. And Jeremiah is saying, in agricultural terms, Jeremiah is saying, you know what? The water is more obedient than the people of Judah because the water does what God instructs it. But these people, in verse 23, have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned aside and gone away. How many this morning, how many are ignoring and disobeying the Lord God of the harvest? The one who offers us not only the physical food, whether it be milk or water or bread or meat, but he also provides us with spiritual food, the food from his holy word. Should we not? Should we not be a people who are trembling in his holy presence? Should we not do as asked in verse 24? Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. So this morning, farmers, who in your view is the Lord of the harvest? That is the question to be answered. Is it the Lord God that Jeremiah talks about? Is it you? Is it the queen of heaven or some other idol? Who should fear the God of the harvest? Well, everyone should fear the God of the harvest. The farmer, the processor, the supermarket and shop owners, and the families that consume the produce of the land in its various forms. Because it is the Lord God of the harvest who has provided our daily bread as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Israel had missed its many opportunities to repent from its sinful ways. And maybe there are those this morning here and listening, and you too, like Israel, have missed many opportunities to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Saviour. Today is your opportunity. And I beg you, like Jeremiah, not to miss it, not to let it slip by. This is a day of opportunity to acknowledge and to worship and to follow the Lord of the harvest. And then in terms of harvest this morning, and I know we're getting tight for time, but in the context of harvest, I also want in a few words to speak to us as the congregation of First Rothfriel and Presbyterian Church. God is the Lord of the harvest who sends the rain to water the seed and to make the crops grow. And without rain, there, there is no crop. Rain, as it is spoken of here in Jeremiah, can also symbolize the Holy Spirit which is poured out on mankind as a blessing from God. And so spiritually, the Holy Spirit waters the seed of Scripture that is sown into the lives and hearts of the people that worship in person or in line week by week through the preaching of God's Word. 
and as sure as the farmer sows the seed into the ground, he knows that a day will come when that will germinate and send up a green shoot and produce a crop. It will produce a harvest. And so it will be for this congregation. No matter how barren or how tough or rugged we may look at this point on this day, the Lord of the harvest who ordains the planting of spiritual seed will honor the planting of that seed in your life and mine with a harvest of souls and of mature believers at the time of his choosing and in the people that he so chooses. So let us labor on like the farmer, be faithful and live in expectation and anticipation not only of another physical harvest, but of a spiritual harvest. Let us, not, let us not be foolish, but rather let us be wise. I know there's more to the cow drinking water and eating grass and turning it white. There's more to it. But others may argue it's foolishness. And so the farmer will stand up for his case and argue back. And so I present to you God's word. And if you think that is foolishness, will you please come back and give us opportunity to talk, to see that God's word is not foolish, and that God is not foolish, but he is the Lord of the harvest, and he provides and will provide in so many ways. Amen. Amen. We can, we can stand with our masks on and we, we come to the words of our closing hymn. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. Let's praise God.